I'd set the scene of where um, Cure Research has come to, especially given what we've found in the last um, year. And this builds on a workshop that Francois mentioned of over 250 participants we had over the weekend here in Melbourne, meaning that we really have the best um, and brightest Cure Researchers all with us at the moment. And I think there are some big um, issues that we've learnt about. And the first is that um, we probably are looking at at the moment trying to achieve long-term remission um, when we talk about cure, meaning time off antiretroviral therapy. How long can we go? And we've realised in the last year that the virus can really hang around for quite some time and then pop up at an unexpected moment in time. It is exactly what we found with the Mississippi baby. What we've learnt from that is that we need much better tools to measure virus while um, people are on treatment and once they stop treatment. And we need much better um, assays to really know where that virus is hiding. And that builds that, um, Nicolas Chamon will t talk a bit about that. I think the most recent cases of the Mississippi baby and also the Boston patients who also rebounded after stopping treatment, admittedly rebounded late after stopping treatment, also tells us that what we need to do here is not just tackle the virus that persists on treatment, but also that we need a good immune response there, ready to tackle any virus that emerges. And I think um, Dan Baruch's work shows us clearly that that um, will, will help us solve some of those puzzles. Um, finally, uh, although we know that early treatment most likely significantly reduces the amount of virus that persists in patients on, on antiretroviral therapy, most people get treated during chronic established infection and we still need to understand how to eliminate those long-lived um, reservoirs of virus. And uh, at the moment, we've, we've talked largely about kick and kill strategies, but we um, probably need to develop um, other, other approaches to those long-lived uh, reservoirs. And finally, um, you know, 80% of uh, people living with HIV, of course, live in low-income countries. Um, there's, needs to be, um, a, there's a lot of effort now to try and engage low-income countries um, in, the, in the search for a cure, as well as um, greater engagement of the pharmaceutical industry, which, um, although some companies have been actively involved in this area, this should be extended, and there are efforts towards that with discussions around perhaps a, developing a public-private partnership. So with that sort of background, um, I'll hand back to Francoise. Thanks, uh, Sharon. So as I said, now uh, uh, Debbie will say a few words about the last latest development regarding the Mississippi infants. Thank you, Francoise. So I'm here with uh, Dr. Hannah Gay from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She's sitting in the front row. And we, in the past uh, three weeks, we've identified that the Mississippi child now has uh, rebound viremia. This uh, rebounding of virus was detected during a routine clinical monitoring visit where viral loads and CD4 T cell counts were done. Um, the viral load rebound was confirmed on a repeated test within 72 hours, and the child was restarted on antiviral treatment. On antiviral treatment, the viral load has dropped, and her CD4 counts have increased from 28% back to 42%. Certainly this is uh, sobering news for us because we've never, never experienced a child who's been HIV infected and have gone off treatment for 27 months without having any detectable virus using our most sensitive assays in the peripheral blood of this child. So what we've learned from this, I think first is and foremost is this child was indeed HIV infected that the effects we saw were really the effects of treatment, not prophylaxis, as has been discussed earlier. The second is we've learned that HIV can establish latency very early. This child is treated at 30 hours of age, and that this latent infection can persist for years. The child is almost four years of age, and can persist in a quiescent state in the absence of any HIV-specific immune responses. Dr. Luziaga has followed this child immunologically for two years, and we have not detected any HIV-specific immune responses. 
Ultra-sensitive tests looking for traces of RNA did not detect any RNA before rebound viremia. So with rebound viremia, the child has seroconverted and has, is now HIV seropositive and has control of viremia, is on antidrought treatment and doing well and will be followed by her pediatrician. So we think we've learned a lot from this case and it does provide us a strong rationale to move forward with the clinical trials uh, to look towards using very early therapy to achieve virologic remission in perinatal HIV infection. Thanks, so Debbie. Uh, Dan, Dan uh, please uh, tell us about uh, your work uh, on uh, vaccine candidate and, and vaccine as also as an approach for cure. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll first uh, discuss a, a preclinical animal study uh, that has a remarkable parallel to the events, the recent events of the Mississippi baby that Debbie just uh, described, showing that in an animal model, the viral reservoir is also established very early, remarkably early, much earlier than anyone had anticipated before. This uh, manuscript is published today in the journal Nature. Um, in this study in monkeys, we showed that early antiretroviral therapy, even very early antiretroviral therapy, is not early enough and was insufficient for curing the viral reservoir. It appears that the reservoir is established even prior to the first evidence of plasma viremia, suggesting that if these data are translatable to humans, then as soon as one is able to diagnose a patient with HIV infection, even with the lowest levels of plasma virus, then the reservoir has already been established, a reservoir that is also refractory to antiretroviral therapy. Clearly, early antiretroviral therapy uh, has benefits and reduces the viral reservoir, but um, in the study that we have published today, it was unable to eradicate the reservoir. The implications are that strategies in addition to early antiretroviral therapy might be needed for viral eradication and cure. Such strategies include monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic vaccines, as well as direct reservoir activators. And uh, many groups, including ours, are working on all three of those strategies. I think I'll stop there and turn it over. Thanks, Dan. Ole, can you tell us about uh, what is on embargo today? Sure. So, um, as, as Dan was saying, um, one of the strategies to maybe try to reduce the reservoir and potentially um, eliminate the reservoir in chronically infected uh, patients is to use this kick and kill approach where you attempt to kick the latently infected cells, so the cells that have archived uh, HIV within their own uh, DNA, to kick these cells out of their resting uh, stage and expose the virus um, on the surface of these cells so they can be killed and uh, eliminated by the immune system. So this kick and kill approach um, we tried to test in uh, six patients at Aarhus University Hospital. We used uh, an H-stack inhibitor, uh, which is a group of anti-cancer drugs. The H-stack inhibitor that we used is called Romadepsin. Um, Romadepsin has been shown in cell cultures and in cells taken out of patients to be able to activate um, uh, these latently infected cells. So that was our rationale for, for moving into a, a small clinical trial. Um, in this trial, we included six patients, uh, five males, one female. They were all uh, well suppressed on antiretroviral treatment uh, for a duration of uh, median duration of, of nine and a half years. Um, what we saw, we infused Romdepsin uh, three times over the time course of 14 days. What we saw was a significant release of viral particles from latently infected cells into the plasma of these uh, six patients um, despite their own antiretroviral treatment. So this, um, these viral particles were easily detectable with standard clinical assays. So we could detect the viral particles with the same assays that we use to monitor uh, treatment response in, in patients and uh, also a, a, an assay that is used by blood banks to screen for HIV in the donor blood. Um, 
Next, we went on to see if we could at least find a, a significant reduction in the size of the reservoir in these six patients. And from our uh, preliminary analysis, it doesn't look like there's a significant reduction in the size of the reservoir in these six patients. So what this tells us is that we can activate cells, we can induce the release of viral particles into the blood of the patients, but this may not be enough to actually make a difference on the size of the reservoir. So the next step would be to use strategies like h inhibitors and combine them with uh, interventions that are targeted towards the immune system. So this could be an HIV vaccine, and we actually uh, have that uh, study just uh, starting uh, last uh, month. Uh, but it could also be other uh, immune interventions that attempts to enhance uh, the immune system's ability to kill these uh, reactivated latently infected cells. Yeah, I think that was... Thank you. Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas uh, uh, has been involved since now many years in uh, uh, trying to identify the cells that uh, play the role of a reservoir and now is trying to find new assays to quantify and measure the reservoir, which is critical for the future. Yeah, thank you, Francois. So, uh, as you just said, uh, it is actually a scientific priority of the International Aid Society to develop novel assays to measure the size of the reservoir. And it is important because we want to find ways to monitor the efficacy of eradication strategies. And uh, right now, the assays that we have uh, are pretty expensive. They require a lot of blood. Uh, and we are not exactly sure what they measure. So we spent a lot of time during the past few years trying to develop novel assays that could be used in those eradication trials. And we came up with this new strategy that we called TILDA, T-I-L-D-A, which is a novel assay that requires only 10 milliliters of blood uh, that is relatively inexpensive, that can be run in two days, and more importantly, that can be implemented pretty much in any lab in the world because you need very basic instrumentation to, to use this assay. So using this assay, we've been able to confirm the benefit of early antiretroviral therapy uh, early in infection. So basically, we found that the size of the reservoir was much more restricted in people who, who start out very early on. Um, of course, the next step for us is to use this assay in clinical trials and again to monitor their efficacy. So the, the value of this uh, HIV cure symposium was to put all of us in the same room and basically I talked with Ole earlier and uh, definitely we will use some of the samples of this clinical trial and run them in the novel assay that, uh, that we have developed. And eventually, of course, what we want to do is to make this assay available to the scientific community. Thanks, Nicolas, and to hand. Steve, your vision? So I've been, asked to talk, yes, I've been asked to talk about um, sort of the future and um, just make a few quick comments. Um, <clears throat> I think it's quite clear right now that the international community is fully engaged in cure research. The funders are engaged, uh, the foundations are engaged, the communities are engaged, uh, most of the academic groups are engaged. This meeting that we just had, uh, you know, was supposed to be for a couple hundred people, but we had a, pro a very long waiting list. So there's a tremendous amount of interest. I will say that, though, in the future, in terms of potential barriers to success, the one major group not yet fully engaged is industry. We're not going to cure anyone unless we develop new drugs, and that's what industry does. And so there's a lot of efforts actually trying to identify the barriers that are preventing industry from getting engaged, um, and we think we know what they are, and we think we might know how to overcome them. Scientifically, uh, I think there are three big issues that we need to tackle. Uh, first, where does the virus live? Debbie's case, the Mississippi baby, suggests that a single virus can live in a single cell living in some reservoir somewhere in the body, and that's all it needs for the virus to take off. Uh, so we need to figure out exactly which cell the virus is in and where it resides. That's the first thing. Second thing, as Nicola just mentioned, we need to be able to measure the virus better. There are probably dozens of cases around the world now in which people have no detectable virus, absolutely no detectable virus on therapy, and they may or may not be cured. We need better ways to measure this. And finally, of course, most importantly, we need to begin to translate some of the early pilot studies into real clinical studies to see if we can actually really advance the cure agenda. And I think this meeting 
is going to uh, be remembered for two things. Number one, Olay's data is the first clear evidence, at least to me, that we can truly identify the latent reservoir, the hidden virus, and shock it out of its hiding place. And that is absolutely critical. I don't think anyone has shown that in people before to the, the same degree that, that Olay has shown in his study. And so I think actually that is the single most important advance at this meeting, and it's going to have a huge impact on the future. That's shock. That's getting the virus out of its hiding place. But once it comes out of its hiding place, we have to kill it. And I would say actually Dan's data that he presented on these novel antibodies that can potentially do that is also going to have a huge impact on the future. Uh, so so that's, that's my vision. I think we need to get in industry engaged. We need to find out where the virus lives. We need to know how to measure it. And we need to begin to do bigger and better studies in terms of shock and kill.